Good evening, welcome all, and we're delighted to be able to host uh, the first uh, keynote speech of the Foreign Secretary in this country. In the brief uh, period that uh, he's been in office, he's already making a distinctive remark, a mark presiding over an expansion of a thousand in the size of diplomatic personnel overseas, putting more boots on the ground, giving, as several commentators have pointed out, an edge to soft power overseas. Second, ensuring that the debate is wider than just Brexit, but there's a focus on Britain's wider place in the world today, ranging from relations with China to Japan, South China Sea, upholding the rules-based international order. It's a particular pleasure for us to be hosting this event because we're the only general <coughs> service think tank on the centre-right which uh, has a dedicated foreign policy unit. The work of Professor John Bew, who heads our Britain in the World programme, has attracted uh, much attention. John, the award-winning uh, biographer, winning the Oral Prize on Clement Attlee, is presiding over this uh, programme and uh, will be producing a work on British grand strategy in the coming months. <coughs> also a particular pleasure for us to be able to doing this because it's a symbol of uh, Britain's wider place in the world and uh, our own role in uh, re addressing the great ideas of the times. We're delighted to have as our new chair of trustees Alexander Downer, previously Australian High Commissioner in London and before that the longest serving foreign minister in his country's history. So we're delighted. We, I think we're in the right <coughs> place at the right time with the right person. I know you'll want to hear what the Foreign Secretary has to say. He's very kindly agreed to answer questions. He'll be chairing questions himself. The only uh, request which I make of you, the usual policy exchange house rule, no question too outrageous. You just have to state your name and organization before asking the question. So Foreign Secretary, welcome here. It's been a few years since you've been here. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. <coughs> Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Dean, thank you for that welcome, and it's a great pleasure to be here. In 1826, my predecessor, Foreign Secretary George Canning, described the global balance of power as a standard perpetually varying as civilization advances and as new nations spring up and take their place amongst established political communities. This was an era when South American countries were seizing independence from Spain and Portugal. The new world was beginning to upset the balance of the old. And Canning saw an opportunity for Britain, an opportunity to rethink British diplomacy, to seek new allies across the Atlantic and thwart old foes France and Spain. Canning had his own bed in the Foreign Office. And when he wasn't lying in that bed complaining about his gout, he ordered British emissaries to sign trade agreements with Mexico and Colombia. Our times have changed. I have no bed in the Foreign Office, and I'm happy to inform you I don't have gout either, at least not yet. Uh, but this country is at a pivotal historic moment. The global balance of power is shifting once more, and post-Brexit, our place within it changes as well. And whilst at the same time our democratic values are arguably under greater threat than at any time since the fall of the Berlin Wall, I want to argue today that we can use our influence, our reach and our power to defend our values by becoming an invisible chain that links the world's democracies. With the backdrop of Brexit, there's no doubt that our role has to change. It's a legal and structural change that will have a profound impact on our foreign policy. And whilst our commitment to European security remains unbreakable, the nature of our relationship with our closest neighbours will naturally change. And we need to ensure this is a change for the better, not the worse. But it isn't just Brexit that's causing change. Other events are even more significant. Let's just take three examples. First, the rise of China and the Asian powerhouse economies. Their growth alters the balance of power with all the speed that Canning foretold. 
1980, China comprised just 2% of the world economy. Today, it's 15%. By 2030, China will overtake the United States as the biggest economy in the world. By 2050, the combined economies of China and India will exceed the GDPs of the entire G7. The US, the UK, Japan, France, Germany, Canada, and Italy put together. Power always follows money. So we mustn't underestimate the profound impact this is going to have. But secondly, we also have to recognize there is a growing threat to democracy and democratic values. It's now becoming clear that the spread of democracy has slowed, gradually come to a halt, and in some respects <coughs> even gone into reverse. We may be suffering what the scholar Larry Diamond described as a democratic recession. Last year, according to Freedom House, 71 countries, and there's just 193 in the United Nations, 71 suffered net declines in political rights and civil liberties. And this is a reversal of what seemed like the inevitable onward march of democracy and democratic values after the lifting of the Iron Curtain. It's of more than symbolic importance that by 2030, for the first time in our lifetimes, the world's largest economy will not be a democracy. And then we have to factor in something else, which is the growing threats to the long-established rules-based international order. Because it's not just within countries that we see change taking place. The interaction between countries is changing too. <coughs> Having a rules-based international order has made us more prosperous and successful than ever before in the history of humanity. But it is now being openly questioned. Chemical weapons have been used to lethal effect in Syria, and for the first time in our history, they've been used on the streets of Britain too. Free trade is under threat, with the World Trade Organization facing the most severe challenge in its history. If new trade barriers were to appear after Brexit, that would make things even worse. The international order that's existed since 1945 was, in large measure, a creation of Britain and its allies. And at, at its heart was a simple credo namely that the best way to create stability was to build a system where might is not automatically right and one where every country, large or small, lives under the protection and security of the UN Charter. By and large, it succeeded. For the first time in history, the bleak vision of Thucydides that the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must was no longer always automatically valid. The United Kingdom, with its empire declining, and the United States in its ascendancy, determined to find a better way. And through a pattern of alliances and multilateral organizations, that vision came into plain sight. But today, that system, that order, is under threat. A new order is rising alongside the old. The democratic values that once bound us together are threatened. The post-war international order that we built to defend them is being questioned. And people are turning to its architects and asking, what now? And in Britain, we've got to ask ourselves exactly the same question. What's the plan? What's our role? How can we strengthen and defend our way of life and the values we believe in? To start, we must build on the strengths that are rooted in our national character. We are the home of parliamentary democracy. We have a profound belief in this country in institutions that allow the peaceful transfer of political power. As an outward-looking, seafaring nation, we have long known how to build alliances in every corner of the globe. As a country endowed with the best universities, scientists, engineers, artists, and authors, alongside, of course, the world's language, we have immense reserves of soft power. We've kept our promise to spend 0.7% of national income on overseas aid. 
giving this country the third biggest development budget in the world. And our history has also created special bonds with the most powerful democracy, the United States, and the world's largest democracy, India. We have the closest of relationships with other parts of the English-speaking world, from Ireland to Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And the success of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting this year in London, one of the biggest ever gatherings of its kind, also shows the enduring strength of our friendships within the world's most important North-South alliance. So that network of friendships is unparalleled. But it's underpinned by something more than just shared history, shared language, or shared culture. Those friendships are underpinned by values. Democracy, the rule of law, separation of powers, respect for individual civil and political rights, a belief in free trade. Those are the things that really bind us. And when those things are under threat, Britain's role, I would argue Britain's obligation, is to defend them. And that's why we need to become an invisible chain linking the world's democracies. And we can have confidence that such an approach will work because alliances built on shared values are always more durable than those based on transactional convenience. We must remember that the impressive progress of modern history has happened not by accident, but by design. Its continued success can't be taken for granted, so it's up to us to strengthen our resolve, make the most of that unique position, and forge an unbreakable chain that will hold those vital values that link our countries. So how do we do this? Well, first, we have to reinvigorate and expand British diplomacy. In the past, you may have heard of retrenchment and retreat, not anymore. Today, I'm announcing the biggest expansion of Britain's diplomatic network for a generation, including 12 new posts and nearly 1,000 more personnel. I can confirm that by the end of next year, we'll open six new high commissions in Lesotho, East Swatini, which used to be Swaziland, the Bahamas, Tonga, Samoa, and Vanuatu. We'll base new resident commissioners in Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Nice job for someone. We'll upgrade the British office in Chad to a full embassy and establish a new British mission to the headquarters of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in Jakarta. Thereafter, we'll open new British embassies in Djibouti and Niger. By the end of 2020, we'll send 335 more British diplomats overseas and reinforce the Foreign Office in London with another 328 personnel. We'll hire another 329 locally engaged staff in our embassies around the world. In total, our network will gain 992 extra people, meaning we're represented in 160 of the 193 UN countries. That's the same as France and only marginally less than the United States and China. At the same time, we're also going to strengthen our skills and expertise. Over the next five years, we're going to build on William Hague's far-sighted decision to reopen the Foreign Office Language School by increasing the number of languages taught from 50 to 70. The 20 new languages will vary from the Central Asian tongues of Kazakh and Kyrgyz to Shona in Zimbabwe and Gujarati in India. Within the next 10 years, we'll double the number of British diplomats who speak a foreign language in the country where they serve from 500 at present to 1,000, meaning that getting on for half of all our overseas postings will be staffed by linguists. We'll also broaden the pool of talent we tap into for our ambassadors. As we regain control of our trade policy, it makes sense to open up applications to external candidates so that one or two positions every year might be filled by people with important experience from outside the civil service, especially the world of commerce. The strength of our network is its professionalism, and that's what I think has given us what is the finest diplomatic service in the world. But we must never close our eyes to the approaches and skills of other industries. 
I'm sure there are experienced multilingual business people who would welcome the chance to enter the service of their country at this critical time, and the Foreign Office of the Future will welcome them to some of our key ambassadorial posts. We'll also ensure that those who champion Britain abroad, abroad better represent the country they serve. So this year we launched a new university outreach programme visiting every part of Britain to encourage ap applications from underrepresented groups. And this includes not just women and BAME applicants, but also those from backgrounds that have not traditionally felt comfortable applying for a career in the service. And finally, a small but I think important detail is something that indicates how I want our diplomacy to develop. When I arrived, we had secure phone connections in my office to the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. But I have now added Japan, France and Germany to that list. It means a lot more technology in my office than in Canning's day, but also allows for the strengthening of important alliances that he would thoroughly have approved of. So taken together, this amounts to a considerable investment in our service, an investment in its capacity and an investment in its future. Adding links to the chain that will allow us to play our part in uniting those countries that share our values. And now we need to use that network to get to work. So we need to redouble our efforts to defend that rules-based international order. And to do that, we need multilateral organisations that are fit for purpose. Reforming outdated and bureaucratic structures is the best way to make sure the institutions they serve do not collapse. That means delivering UN reform, as advocated by UN Secretary General Guterres. It means fairer burden sharing in NATO, which continues to be the bedrock of European security. It means WTO reform, so that we succeed in warding off the dangerous temptations of protectionism. It means reforming the World Bank, so its governance reflects the changing balance of the global economy. And it means reforming the structures of the Commonwealth, so there is proper accountability for the Secretariat and a more effective decision-making process. To strengthen that invisible chain between the democracies, we must also ensure we're better at acting in concert when we face real and present threats. That was shown to great effect after the nerve agent attack in Salisbury. Then, far from buckling in the face of Russian aggression, 28 democracies came together and expelled 153 Russian spies the biggest coordinated expulsion in the history of diplomacy. When we act in concert, we are strong. When we act together, the price for transgression becomes too high for the perpetrator. But this nimbleness of response often eludes us. So I want our fine diplomats to find a way to do this more effectively. And that means going beyond traditional diplomacy focused on other governments and creating new partnerships including with the private sector. Nor is it solely when we face security threats that we should strengthen the chains that connect like-minded countries. We must be better at standing together to defend the values we share, whether that is the prevention of sexual violence in conflict, the struggle against the illegal wildlife trade, or threats to freedom of expression. Because access to fair and accurate information is also something that we should remember is the lifeblood of democracy. And for that reason, prompted in no small part by the tragic murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, I'm placing the resources of the Foreign Office behind the cause of media freedom. This campaign will be marked by a major international conference that I'm going to be hosting in London next year. And finally, as we strengthen our diplomatic efforts, we must never forget the importance of speaking from a position of strength. Soft power matters, but is immensely more effective when backed up by hard power. In the last resort, we need to be able to call on our fine armed forces, whose importance was recognized by new funding in the budget this week. So we will continue to spend at least 2% of GDP on defense and we will replace our independent nuclear deterrent, and we will continue to call on others in NATO to play their part too. 
almost 200 years on, Canning's law still holds. New nations rise and the global order changes. The apparently inevitable progress of democracy since the fall of the Berlin Wall is no more. Like Canning, we must seize the opportunities that present themselves within the tumult. We must work to strengthen and defend our values across the globe. And as we face our post-Brexit future, Britain has a role to play. It is one we are uniquely suited to deliver, remembering our responsibilities, not overstating our strength, but not understating it either. Because right now, our history our networks and our unique combination of soft and hard power gives us a real ability to shape the course of history in line with our values. So let's play our part, helping to build that invisible chain between those who share our values and make that chain as strong and resilient as it needs to be as new nations rise and the world order is challenged anew. Thank you very much. So I'll uh, take questions from uh, media colleagues first. Um, and have we got Nina from CNN here? Hi. Secretary Nina Dos Santos, the Europe editor at CNN. Um, I'd like to return to the subject of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, given the CIA director has heard the last moments of Jamal Khashoggi, and presumably this information has been shared with UK authorities, why wait for a Saudi investigation? with all the conflicts of interest, potential conflicts of interest that that could generate. Surely at this point, British authorities have enough information at this point to understand what happened, who did what, and to take action from here. Thank you. Well, I think the information is becoming clearer, and very tragically, um, the more information that emerges, uh, the more consistent it seems to be with our worst fears of what might have happened. Um, I have made it very clear that if those reports turn out to be true, uh, that will be completely inconsistent with our values and it would have an impact on our relationship. Um, we have a strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia. We will be considered in what we do uh, and we will act as far as we can with our allies who are in a similar position. But. Um, you know, we have to be clear that this kind of thing is completely unacceptable and we have to respond accordingly. Um, and uh, I don't think we are quite at the point where the, the Turkish investigation, and I think it's a kind of uh, Turkish and Saudi uh, investigation, but it seems to be more driven by the Turkish side than the Saudi side. I don't think we're at the point where it is completely concluded. Uh, but what I said very clearly in the House of Commons last week is that the way we react will in part be decided by whether there is a, a credible response from Saudi Arabia that gives us the confidence that this kind of thing cannot and will not happen again. And so that's what we will wait to see before we judge our response. Have we got Debbie from Sky? Hi. Thank you. Um, the US last night um, gave us some information about um, the Yemen and their, 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 their call for um, a cessation of hostilities. Was the UK given advance warning that the US would be doing that? Um, and then just on the Khashoggi case, you said that you want a considered response, um, but you've also flagged up um, earlier today the importance of arms sales to the UK economy to jobs. Does that mean that protecting jobs is a price worth paying when it comes to dealing with a regime if it's found to be true, that has authorised the state-sponsored state, state assassination of a journalist? Well, what I said, I'll take the second part of your question first. What I said uh, this afternoon was that uh, we have one of the strictest arms export regimes in the world, set up by Robin Cook back in 2000. Um, and we have uh, an independent process where someone at arm's length from ministers, not me, uh, makes a judgment as to whether there is a clear risk of uh, arms sales violating international humanitarian law. And I think having set out that strict process, as I say, stricter, I think, than uh, nearly any other country, I think we have to follow that process. Um, and uh, the people making that judgment, of course, take into account all the available evidence. Um, but I think it's right that we do follow that process. 
Um, and I think it is also worth pointing out what the, um, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee said in their September report on human rights, where they quoted someone as saying that they don't think that there's any country that does more than Britain when it comes to the promotion of human rights around the world. So I would like to reassure you that we do take this incredibly seriously. And when it comes to uh, not just human rights, but humanitarian tragedies, um, what is happening in Yemen is very much on our mind. We're talking about a country where getting on for half the population needs humanitarian food aid. In other words, they don't have enough to eat on a daily basis, and uh, three-quarters of the population needs some kind of humanitarian aid. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy what's happening in Yemen. Uh, we have been in discussion with the Americans at an official level in terms of uh, what they think can be done. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to support their call um, for a cessation of hostilities. I had a discussion last night with Martin Griffiths, who's the UN Special Envoy, about how this plan might work. And um, I think there is an, an opportunity now that we are very keen to grasp to uh, de-escalate the situation and allow a humanitarian corridor uh, so that vital humanitarian aid can, can get into that country. Have we got Catherine from The Times here? Uh, Foreign Secretary, I wanted to ask you just um, about your response to that last question. And you talked about an independent process to judge whether there's um, any breach of humanitarian law in Saudi. Um, in fact, many human rights organizations have said that you are far too dependent on the Saudi's own investigation and that you haven't taken those into consideration when making that assessment. Well, the, let me be clear. The independent assessment as, as to whether there's a clear risk of um, IHL breaches is an assessment that's made in the UK by us. Um, and they take into account all the available evidence. Um, and they take into account the, the credibility of assurances that we get from Saudi Arabia. So I, I think it is a, a pretty solid process. Um, uh, and uh, that's the process that we want to follow. Have we got Paul from ITV here? Foreign Secretary, just coming back to the situation in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, <coughs> I thought it was quite stark today when you said in the Commons that Britain's commercial interests will influence how we act towards Saudi Arabia. What is more important to you, the jobs of British workers or the lives of Yemenis and journalists? Well, I think you are um, slightly misrepresenting what I said. I said. There are indeed British jobs at stake, particularly in the northwest and the southwest of uh, the country. And I think that anyone in my shoes uh, needs to be considered in their response when uh, the livelihoods of British people are at stake. But what we made clear, and what I made clear this afternoon, is that uh, you know, if these reports are uh, of what happened to Khashoggi turn out to be true, that would be contrary to our values. We would act accordingly, and it would have an impact on the relationship with Saudi Arabia. And so I couldn't have been clearer. I think my comments have probably been stronger than any other foreign minister. So we are absolutely clear, but um, you know, part of what you do is to have to take, out, take account all the different factors, and, and uh, commercial considerations are one element, but actually a much more significant one is the strategic partnership that we have with Saudi Arabia in the region, and uh, what we can do to maximize that to make progress in the Yemen situation, and that's what we're trying to do. I'm going to open it up now to uh, questions from the floor. So who would like to ask a question? Yes. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Uh, John Bew from Pulse Exchange and uh, King, King's College London. Um, as the, the questions from the press adverted to, foreign policy is a, uh, always a process of calibration between rights, uh, sense of values, and, and interests. But looking beyond that, what major strategic dilemmas do you see for the UK? Uh, that go beyond that, uh, uh, real difficult choices like, say, between uh, the United States and, and uh, a rising China in, in a conflict or an issue? What are the major strategic challenges ahead? Well, I'm, I'm pleased to use the word strategic because um, I was in front of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee this afternoon and I was telling them the conversation that I had with uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger over the summer when, as a, a new boy foreign minister, and he's obviously I guess the most experienced diplomat in the world. I said, what's the difference between a good foreign minister and a, uh, a pedestrian foreign minister? And he said, a good foreign minister is strategic. I think Alexander would uh, probably concur with that. And um, 
I think what we have to be is, it's not really about foreign ministry, it's about us as a country. We have to be strategic and we have to recognize that the, the world order is changing. And the most important thing, not just for us, but for um, countries that share our values, is to make sure that we have an international order where those values are protected. And uh, people are looking to us. One of the surprises uh, that I think British foreign secretaries have is they find that when you go abroad, people have a lot more respect for us than we sometimes have for ourselves. But one of the reasons for that is because we were one of the architects of the modern international order. And I would argue that one of the things that distinguishes the international order that we've had since 1945 is that as it has been based on broadly democratic values. And the risk is that we move to a new world order wi where we go back to what's been much more normal in human history, which is essentially one where might is right. So I think that's the thing that we have to step back and figure out. And I think that's very important in the context of Brexit, because everyone is thinking about Brexit. Uh, everyone's reading the papers. Everyone's naturally worried about uh, Brexit and whether we're going to be able to get the outcome that we want. But actually, there are these much bigger things. I think in 10 years' time, we're far more likely to be talking about those broader changes than we are about Brexit. Let me, yes, gentleman at the back. I'm from Chinese Embassy. Just now you mentioned uh, Larry Diamond's point of uh, democratic uh, reception. Ten years ago, we had a global financial crisis, not quite uh, a global recession. And nowadays, we also have this rise of nationalism and populism. So do you see, is there any link between the three things, global financial crisis, democratic recession, and the rise of nationalism and populism? Thank you. I think it's a very um, good question, and I, I'm sure there are links between all of those things. And I think one of the challenges for democracies is that, partly because of the financial recession, but I think partly for other reasons as well, all of us have got great chunks of our population that are pretty dissatisfied with the way life is and are not convinced that the system is working for their best interests. And I think that is a challenge to elected politicians to understand how we reconnect with the people who give us our jobs. Um, and um, part of it is because the impact of the 2008 financial crisis has been particularly severe. If you look across the world, it's been, uh, on the whole, countries like China have continued to prosper and flourish. And in fact, uh, thanks to China, there's been huge progress in the number of people being lifted out of poverty. And middle class people have tended to do all right, but people on lower incomes in richer countries, that is the one group that has tended to lose out the most. And so I think there's a financial uh, reason for it. But I think there's also um, issues to do with the way the, the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of democracies work in an age of social media. And uh, that has also uh, made us appear less responsive. Maybe we are less responsive than we need to have been in the modern technological era. So uh, that puts a big responsibility on us to be better at connecting with our own electorates. Yes, another question. Um, lady right at the back. Sorry. I was excited by one of the headlines today uh, that there's a potential for ambassadors to uh, represent from examples like Richard Branson. Um, and how would that exactly work? Because obviously my um, research is space. If they're representing in America and they're representing, you know, getting things from Italy and various different places, how can they impartially be an ambassador for the UK? Would it mean that they would have to choose? Because obviously Richard Branson, I believe, has a very strong impact in the space industry. And you don't have to answer it now. It's only just sort of popped into my mind. And I just wanted to ask how that would work if he was put forward. Because obviously, he's brilliant, but he also has quite a lot going on you know, in space. Uh, can I just say that's a great example for colleagues from the media to ask a question and say, you don't have to answer it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not the normal style. but. Um, um, I, let, let's be clear what I was saying and what I wasn't saying. So what I wasn't saying is that I want to move away from a uh, largely professional 
diplomatic service. I think it's one of our great strengths that our diplomats are highly trained uh, linguists. They're incredibly professional. They are respected all over the world for their ability. And, and that's one of the great strengths of the, the Foreign Office. But I, I do think that we also have people who have been outstandingly successful in other fields who could be great ambassadors for Britain, particularly when they have a close personal link with another country. And so uh, our intention is one or two posts every year, no more than that, might go to people who have been truly outstanding in another field. Um, but uh, it will go through the, the proper Foreign Office recruitment process. There will be absolutely no question of any conflict of interest. Uh, and they will have to compete with career diplomats to get those posts. So it's going to be completely meritocratic. Um, but I think uh, it would be good for the Foreign Office if we could have one or two posts uh, that were filled by people who've been outstanding in other fields. I think they can bring something to us um, and, uh, and also hopefully we can give something to them as well. Gentleman here, yes, James. Um, James Landell, BBC. Uh, you, you talk about reforming the inter international institutions of, the, of the, uh, the international order. Do you think they should reform to reflect the new power structures? So should India be on the Security Council? Should uh, Italy leave the G7? Um, and finally, second, um, you talk about all these new posts and ambassadors. Where are you going to find the money? How much is it going to cost? Um, is that a question you want me to answer now? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so in terms of uh, the money first, um, this comes from the additional allocation that was given to the Foreign Office to expand its diplomatic network in the post-Brexit era. So um, in terms of the costs that are going to be in covered in the current spending review period, we are comfortable we're able to do that. And uh, this is a big commitment over a 10-year period, which we are confident that we'll be able to fund. Um, in terms of the reform of international institutions, I think this is a very, very important point because um, I do think that international institutions need to reform to reflect the changing balance of power because that is the way that they will continue to get the buy-in from rising powers. And I think perhaps the best example of that is the increasing influence of China at the United Nations. And I think China is a big supporter of the United Nations because it feels that its voice is heard inside the UN. But I think there are other institutions that need to undertake similar reforms. So Broadly speaking, because I'm a believer in the role of uh, multilateral organizations as being important to that rules-based international system, uh, then we do need to reform, and the UK will be supporting efforts to do those reforms. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Ben Glaze from the Daily Mirror. Um, when you arrived at the FCO, how surprised were you to find you only had secure lines to our Five Eyes allies? Um, and why did you particularly want bat phones to uh, France, Germany, and Japan? Well, um, you know, uh, I'm not at all surprised to find that we had uh, phone lines to our Five Eyes allies, but um, I think we have to recognize that there are other countries that we might need to have those secure links. And one of the things that I've noticed as foreign minister is that uh, foreign ministers around the world communicate a lot by text and WhatsApp, and uh, that's the way a lot of diplomacy is done these days. And that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, but there are certain conversations that it's wiser to have on a secure line, and that's why we're going to expand the number of people we can talk to in that way. I'm sure there'll be others, too, that follow. Um, yes. Hi, Foreign Secretary Adam Pym from Business Insider. On the subject of surprise, um, were you surprised by Dominic Raag's prediction that a Brexit deal will be finalised by the 23rd of November, or do you share that prediction? Well, I think it's entirely possible um, that we could make progress, enough progress by then. Uh, there are broadly two substantive outstanding issues. They're both pretty difficult ones. Um, uh, one of them is the degree to which our trade is frictionless um, in the post-Brexit environment, and, and the other is the Northern Irish backstop. Um, but I think if we put our minds to it, um, it's entirely possible that we could resolve those issues. And I, I think that although there's a degree of doom and gloom about the Brexit talks at the moment. Uh, the fact that we've got to this stage uh, a month before, or not quite a month, but nearly a month before the 21st of November, and it does boil down to those two issues, I think is broadly encouraging. 
probably got time for last one. I'll take these two then. Uh, lady right at the back. Um, as you said, um, the changing world order was basically based on building stability, um, but we're living in a time of rising conflict. So as we're building new relationships post-Brexit, how are you going to make sure that not only through delivering aid, we're going to focus on conflict prevention and peace building? And will the Global Britain strategy actually make a commitment to building peace and conflict prevention? Um, I think the answer to that question is yes. And uh, we have, as I mentioned in, in the speech earlier, the third largest development budget in the world. And a, an increasing proportion of that is focused on conflict prevention. Um, and the Select Committee, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, did a, a report that challenged us in September, asking whether we could actually do more within our budget on atrocity prevention. Um, because, um, you know, there are times when uh, far-sighted action could potentially prevent some of the appalling things that do happen. So, uh, yes, we are absolutely committed to doing that. Um, the one thing I would challenge, if I may, in what you said, is that actually if you look at the statistics on the number of people dying in conflicts, it's actually down by about three quarters over the last 30 years. So we have, it doesn't feel like it because the newspapers are extremely good, colleagues are extremely good at, um, at pointing out where there are conflicts and making them newsworthy, and it's their duty to do that. But actually the overall number of people dying in conflicts has been going down across the world. My observation is, well, that is a great sign of the success and stability of the international system in the period since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we need to make sure that we preserve what has worked in that system and not let it slip through our fingers. I'll take a final question here. I can hear you, don't mind. Uh, Ilya Dmitrich of Russia, News Agency TASS. Uh, it's not secret that the relations between the two countries are at a very low point. What, from your point of view, has to happen in order for these relations to begin improving? Thank you. Well, um, let me answer that question very directly. Um, you know, until quite recently, it felt like Russia wanted to be part of the international rules-based system and to, um, and to help strengthen it. And we were very excited about the possibility of a completely different relationship with Russia compared to the relationship that we had at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. But then we had the 2008 invasion of Georgia. We had the 2014 invasion of Crimea. We've had uh, cyber attacks, uh, chemical weapon attack in Salisbury. And um, that, is, that has worried us greatly. And so we would love to find a way of uh, bringing China back into the international, bringing Russia, sorry, apologies to a Chinese <laughs> colleague there, uh, bringing Russia back into the international rules-based system. Um, but uh, we also have to make it very clear that if the kind of activities uh, that we've been seeing recently continue, then the price will be too high. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It's been a very interesting evening. Thank you very much.